I noticed in class one day, reading the homework, that euthanasia, three years ago roughly, that euthanasia was non-decriminalized in Colombia. And I said, oh God, this is a lie. Why are they always picking on the Colombians? So I did what everybody else does, right? I grabbed my phone and I started Googling. And the next thing I knew was, wow, I had missed it. How did I miss it? I have two Colombian parents. I've traveled multiple times to Colombia, and I had missed it. And people had made reference to me about the point, and I thought, what are they saying? You know, I did not help anybody die. This is very dangerous for me in the states of Illinois, uh, Illinois, state of Illinois and in America. I could lose my license. Please don't repeat this to me. But then I realized, oh, that's why. They think that it's also non-decriminalized in Illinois. So I decided to go ahead and take the leap and call the guy up. I'm thinking I'm going to get his machine, his secretary, and to my surprise, an hour and a half later, I was hanging up and we were like best friends. He's like, you need to fly out. I don't want to go to Chicago. I was just there. Come, come, come. So sure enough, I um, decided that although I was terribly against a lot of what we've discussed today, Shame on me if I plan to be the future gerontologist and not get the information. So I ended up deciding that it is a little death oriented and maybe not so gerontology oriented, but isn't it all those little factors that really help us age differently? Um, Deborah opened up this morning with the power of the prescription. She reminded us that the patient doesn't necessarily have to take the pill to regain the control, it's just enough to have the pill. So I found myself having the same thoughts and I said, well, are the Colombians aging better because euthanasia is an option for them? And two and a half years later, I believe that we will find that that is the case. So what is Colombia? 46 million people, roughly, and in the census 2016. And out of those 46 million people, we have 90% 90, 90 Catholics. As a child, uh, I already mentioned, I used to travel all the time, three months out of the year. And I assumed that everybody was Catholic because Colombia is so Catholic. Um, to the point that a lot of people have talked about today, the emotional toll that the physicians feel when they perform the acts. And I thought to myself, I'm going to travel to Colombia by myself. I'm not going to dump this on my family there. What am I going to do? So I had a friend who was a priest, and I thought, well, I'm Catholic. Let me get down on my knees and ask this guy, please, please forgive me. I want to go learn this. I don't know if I'm for it, I don't know if I'm against it, but shame on me if I do not take the leap. Dr. Quintana is willing to play with me, so why wouldn't I take the opportunity to take the experience myself? Uh, I believe Ellen and Dr. Green also talked about those feelings that they had. So at least I found the priest who was willing to, to help me get through it, because where was I gonna run afterwards? I have to tell you, at the end of the day, I have seen 20 years of horror. I have been a hospice administrator. I have been a nursing home administrator. I know what suffering is. I have a family member who died of ALS, and I hate to say it, but I am allergic to painkillers. So what do you think I'm going to do if I need something? I probably will end up going to Columbia to get some help because I know that in the United States, I don't have those options. So we've talked about MAID, MAID all day. What MAID options are available in Colombia? Thankfully, we're able to withhold treatment if we don't want chemo, CPR, any of those um, more aggressive treatments. But we also have the luxury that euthanasia has been non-decriminalized as well as regulated. It's not an issue of religion for us. It's not an issue of law, not even of ethics. It's a matter of compassion. I believe that Colombians really feel it at a different level. They're very compassionate. And at the end of the day, they were willing to put a lot of their obstacles aside to be able to take care of their loved ones. So 
So when did it happen? It started in 1997, and it seems so long ago, over 20 years. But all they did was it allowed for two things. It allowed for the patient to receive the service after they requested it, and it allowed for the doctor to perform services without legal prosecution. It was a huge step towards death with dignity, but unfortunately, it just left us with questions. We have no answers, and for a very long time, we had no guidelines, we had no regulation. Well, there was no plan, no training, no education for the families as well as the physicians. It seemed lack of support and lack of financing also drove the process. Finally, in 2015, almost 20 years later, they came up with resolution 12116. It gave us clear definitions of a conscious patient and an unconscious patient uh, process for requesting and receiving the service. For the conscious patient, we found that they had to be very similar, as discussed earlier, a terminal illness with suffering with an expectation of six months or less. Two physicians have to sign off, at least one that has the specialty. The patient must initiate the process. What does that mean? There's no marketing for this. There is no uh, brochure. There is no doctor that really advertises it. And the minimal time that I do spend in person with Dr. Quintana, I often wonder why he doesn't have a business card that he offers uh, people that approach us or people that he's servicing. It has to be initiated by the patient before he actually takes the step to give them a contact information. It's a verbal request for the conscious patient. All alternatives must be ruled out and declined. The patient must continue to verbalize the desire. It follows the committee review that we've discussed for other countries. And in our case, it talks about a physician, some sort of psychiatrist or a psychologist, and a legal representative. Informed consent, where patient continues to verbalize the desire, must be expressed at all time, including at the end. So under this conscious patient criteria, I don't see how we can include an Alzheimer's patient yet, an ALS patient like my uncle, or anybody who has dementia. It gets a little trickier with the unconscious patient. The next of kin has the burden to provide a previous written expression of the desire, either videotaped or audioed also. And that seems like we could just take a piece of paper and write it down, but I have to tell you, these last two years that I've spent back and forth working with Dr. Quintana in Colombia, I've learned that it's not just that simple. It's not a, in Chicago, I just go to the notary, I pay a dollar and they sign off. This is Colombia. Here you have to go, you need to wait, you need to have your forms with you, then they wanna take your pictures, you need to get fingerprinted, and then a few lawyers sign off at the notary office before you actually walk out with a paper. So it's more detailed than what I was personally um, accustomed to, but under the circumstances, I kind of applaud them for having that detailed service available. And of course, they also do the video and the audio, which a lot of our speakers have recommended. Then we go back to following the criteria of the conscious patient, and the family members need to continue to express their desire. Financing is also tricky. We're told that the EPS, or La Identidad de Promotoras de Salud, covers it. And it's true, that's what the law says. I asked Dr. Quintana about two weeks ago, we were having lunch, I'm curious, out of the cases that you've covered, how many have been covered by the EPS? Anybody wanna take a crack? Zero. Wow, it's, it's amazing. It is just truly eye-opening that you see one thing and the reality is completely different. 2018 was a great year for us. With some serious effort, Resolution 285 passed, which allows euthanasia for minors. The minimum age is seven years old. 
you'll remember that I told you as a child, I started accepting the idea that the whole world was Catholic. And the issue with children having to be at least seven is exactly that. It's a brain that's developing and they don't understand the concept of the own death. So unfortunately, children under seven years old still are withheld and the parents are not able to make the decision on behalf of the child. Older children, ages seven to 13, may request the procedure and are required to have parental consent. But by age 14, they believe that psychologically, you're prepared and understand what your own death is, that it is permanent and there's no returning to life. So they no longer require the consent of the parent. As a matter of fact, if the parent is opposing, the child is still able to continue the process. And for the child, for the children seven and older, we follow the same criteria for the unconscious and the conscious patient. So who didn't come? Dr. Quintana. We're almost at 400 successful cases. Uh, I have to tell you, I've witnessed, and it's probably the most beautiful one and a half minutes that I've ever spent with a dying patient. Uh, the family was much more in control. They had the messages that they wanted to leave. The patient was involved right down to the lipstick and the earrings that she wanted to wear, which I think is very dignified. It's very compassionate. It was very, very loving. I like that the glass is half full for Colombia, and I want to apologize to all those countries that don't have that glass half full. That's very, very sad, and I do hope that there is more movement, and if Columbia can help in any way, please contact. We would love to see more, more countries having at least that glass half full. So we already talked about that the APS isn't covering it, so who's covering it? The patients are covering it, or in the, or in the majority of the cases, over 50% of the cases, Dr. Quintana is doing the work pro bono. Our dreams for improved death with dignity. We're bad, huh? We have a glass half full. We have rights that many do not have. And I'm gonna stand up here and tell you that I want more. I want the glass half full. No, I want it completely full. Maybe with the children, ma'am, that's 70%, but there's still more work to be done. That psych degree, I can't help but think that I like my numbers, I like the research, I like the statistics. So I'd like to know, what is the reality? How many completed cases do we really have? Is there another physician that's doing it and we're just not catching it? We'd also like to see the cases that are being denied. What, what is the reason for the denial? And how can we support these people who felt that they needed a service that we can't give them? Statistics for Colombian attitude related to the euthanasia and to the made efforts. Again, not really existing. The data is there, but it's at least 15 years old. Death certificates. What are we putting on the death certificates? I tried thinking, okay, I can go dig out death certificates and see if I could possibly run some numbers that way, but I couldn't because we don't know what diagnosis is the final diagnosis that is being listed for the cause of death on the death certificates. I think our biggest issue is training for healthcare providers. We shared the theme today. Um, I think I wrote down Monica, Asuncion, and Philip all mentioned, hey, the doctors are ignoring the people requesting the services and doing what they choose. How is that respecting the patient's autonomy, especially at such a delicate moment? I'd also like to see a more universal advanced directives I'll give you the case of me in Illinois. Wouldn't it be nice that I should be able to at least put in that advanced directive that if physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia or another uh, made service is available to me, I should at least be able to indicate it. Because what happens if I am in that car accident five years later after I created that program, and, uh, after I created the advanced directive and the law has finally caught up to what I really wanted? And the goal is, of course, the autonomy and the privacy and the confidentiality for the patient. Finally, I just want to thank you 
for your time this evening and provide you our contact information if you have any other questions or any comments or if there's any collaboration that we can provide you. Please do not hesitate. This is not a problem for Columbia. This is a problem for the world. We all have the right to have a dignified death. And I'd like to close with the following statement. The presence of death is no excuse to stop living with dignity. On the contrary, the presence of death allows us the opportunity for an act of love, compassion, for a dignified death. Thank you and have a nice evening.